Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can can you hear me well? Yeah. Can you see the screen? <laughs> okay. So I propose to start. So thank you for being here. It's almost the end of that clue, but still you are brave to be here. So uh, today's topic is modern penetration test tricks for well, faster, wider, and greater engagement at the end. So let's start just a few, few information, a bit of context. Who am I? Just an infosec passionate. Maybe you you ever use one of my tools, I don't know, on GitHub. Just uh, say hello if you say so, if you, you if you did so. So just that's just me, a French guy. So today's agenda, one, a bit of context. So why do you need, as penetration tester, you need to adapt your techniques and your methodologies. Then the tricks. And at the end, uh, a, a small conclusion about the, the tricks we, we, we should see. So let's start. So what technically changed during that decade for penetration testing and and computer science uh, on the whole uh, about security. First, it is possible now, right now, to scan the entire uh, IPv4 space in a few minutes, hours or days. So a few, uh, um, few attempts uh, at the beginning of, the, of that decade with uh, census. Um, then, currently with asynchronous programming, ZMAP, mass scan, unicorn scan, I guess you, you know these tools. And uh, uh, mostly the third party platforms uh, that provide you some data sets that you not a, uh, not even uh, you don't even need to to perform your own scan if you want to. So I guess you know you know this platform. Uh, who in this room knows about Zoomai? Who ever heard about Zoomai? So everyone's okay. Everyone's talking about Shodan, but Zoomai is the f Chinese Shodan. It provides good data also. You should try um, scans.io at census.io. Sure, you can also query all of the, uh, open source information you want by building your own platform, centralizing everything. By, or online by querying a lot of cool services, ReconNG, which is a framework, not a service, domain tools, PestBin, certificate transparency, have I been pound, and so, and many more. So just take a look at that link. It, it, uh, index a lot of stuff. It's really cool. And, and mo most interestingly, interestingly, uh, you can now pull large Windows corporate infrastructures in really few minutes, few clicks, few commands. Uh, with reconnaissance, starting with reconnaissance, power view, blow down to chase admin and assets. Then, uh, exploitation. I'm sure you know about crack map exec, responder, and, and a tiny and small uh, attack vector named Kerberos roasting, which uh, is really useful. Then, for post exploitation, mimicat, you know it. Invoke mimicat when you want to be still here, or even empire when you, you're professional, uh, you want to automate a lot of stuff. Um, just like Metasploits, or you can automate really everything, every step in the star. So, um, is the, is, it is, uh, done by the guy behind CrackMap Exec by Bleeder, which is really cool also. So, why do you need to adapt your techniques? Because, frankly, uh, from, from, uh, from many years ago, uh, we can observe that m more and more security folks, you, write more and more tools. That's the first observation. The second one is that the tools are good quality and reliable, which, haven't been the case from the beginning of uh, InfoSec. Uh, InfoSec. Uh, remember Netcat, the, fir the first version of Netcat, uh, were vulnerable to a buffer overflow. Uh, so useful for attack, but yeah, you should take a look at uh, also at the code you are executing, um, because you will be asked to cover to cover wider scopes. In the few uh, in my past few engagements, I was asked to cover like hundreds. Uh, of thousands of assets for large companies to perform some configuration reviews, like 10 control points on each, and to cover a worldwide scope, so, uh, and to pwn uh, <laughs> the whole world, so, for this company, so really you will be asked to cover wide scopes, and <clears throat> to be frank, it, it has already changed, you really need to adapt your techniques to cover, uh, uh wide scope fast, faster and better. Um, you don't have to choose fast, uh, like you don't have to choose fast or, or, or good quality or stuff. You, you can do, you can do everything, uh, but you need to scale right now. So enough context. Let's start with the first tricks, the first observation I, I did throughout, throughout my, uh, my years of pen, pen testing. So as you know, there's a lot of iterative work in, in our field. Uh, you know, this kind of wheel. You scan some targets, you exploit them, you, you harvest and you find some new data. And you use the newly found data to other targets or even previous targets to gain some more intelligence on it. So you need a, a good data format to process uh, all of this. Um, I recommend CSV. I'm not saying CSV is the best format for everything. I'm saying it's the best format for humans. 
Um, it's a common format while it's used, uh, it, but mostly it's a human readable format, unlike JSON or XML. And as you are humans, I guess, if you complete the Turing test, you should use CSV. Uh, it's a rather simple format, but there's no standard. There's no RFC or, or so on, or, or true standard on CSV, so you, there are some traps like in, in encoding and in coaching, so please use UTF-8 and quote everything. So here it's ex in this example, uh, I, I advise you to, to quote everything, every field, uh, not, not this one, not to use that format without code because you will have some mess at any point. And one last thing, <laughs> you, know, you have your injection even in CSV, so don't open, don't, don't trust CSV you cannot trust, uh, don't open CSV you cannot trust, yeah, because yeah, even, even in Excel you can, you can exploit some stuff. In short, use CSV as much as possible. So to use it, you, you need some tools to provide CSV stuff. So first, I will just show you some few cool tools commonly used uh, in penetration testing that offer CSV support for input or output or both, starting with Nmap to CSV, which is a tool, uh, a tool I did uh, to provide and to scan Nmap result to CSV. Then you have WFuzz, like, just like Gerbuster, but better and modern. Uh, test SSL dot, dot sh to uh, to really uh, have a, a great insight of your on your SSL layer. Bloodhound, you know you know it. Of crack the the legacy and uh, old school uh, password cracker. ReconNG, which is a cool of, uh, OSINT uh, framework. And Icto, again a legacy and useful web scanner. And finally Nessus. And I could even quote like uh, Qualys. This is the same kind of idea. Nessus and Qualys offer CSV output. So, now you have a CSV, how you can handle it with, which, with, with tools. So first, don't, <laughs> don't leave that room because I'm talking about Excel. There will be like really more advanced tricks that using Excel, but you need to know that with Excel you can open easily CSV. It's a, that's a good format for it. But the main drawbacks is that the max line of Excel is only one million. One million is really short in our world now. Uh, remember when I was asked to cover like hundreds of thousands of assets for big companies? I had to perform a, a configuration review on 10 control points on each asset. So I'm uh, directly at 1 million lines in my, in my file and, I can, and, and Excel cannot handle it. Uh, so re you really need to work differently. That's the point. Right now, even in Excel, there are some new features like um, starting with um, the current version of Excel, the latest one. You, you have a module named Power Query, which is a useful module to, uh, um, a native uh, module to perform some uh, pivots, uh, some join between data and really better than before. So uh, uh, still the, the max number of line is still a problem and is still present, but maybe you can find some uh, easier stuff to do with Excel. So right now, some more advanced stuff, CSV kit, who in this room knows about CSV kit? <sighs> really few people. If you work with CSV, you need CSV kit. Uh, CSV kit is a, is a suite, suite of command line tools. It really changed my, my, my life re quite recently, but there's a lot of tools, uh, um, specific tools, just like the Unix philosophy, one tool to perform one, one simple task and, and do it good. So to manage your input, you have CSV clean, CSV format, just to convert and to, to, to go from a uncoated to a coated stuff, comma or semicolon and so on. Then for processing, um, the most exciting stuff is maybe CSV join and uh, also CSV SQL because with this kind of tool, CSV, a CSV file is no longer a, a, a dumb file. It is a real database. You can perform SQL, in, uh, SQL queries, not injection, but queries on a CSV file with this kind of tool. It is really awesome and it really changed my, my life and my way of doing my work um, related to the other tools I mentioned you just before. Uh, but this kind of of tool is really useful for your CSV. Um, some demo, I would just, I have, I have a lot of demos to show you. Just let's start with one, uh, one direct and simple, uh, example, which is CSV stat. CSV stat is just made for one thing, printing stat or CSV file. It's, it's pretty, pretty dumb, but, uh, here I will be processing a, a small Nessus result, a really small Nessus result, and you will see, uh, you will see what, what it looks like. So it takes, it passes the whole columns and it can print some different stuff on, on the, about the column, some numerical, numerical computation. So the, the mean sum and so on. The most frequent value. So maybe right now, if you, if we move to like CVE, 
you can see that the most frequent value on my Nessus file is this kind of CV. It can give you some insights uh, about what's what's to be done and what's really cool uh, in your scan in your result. So let's say now I, I do now I, I do know which which column I want to filter just for better precision. Precision. I still am using CSV stats. Uh, just filtering on some columns, and here again the same kind of result. You can see some uh, some insights. So here I'm filtering filtering on plugin ID, uh, uh, filtering ID, uh, plugin ID. Sorry, um, CVE, CVSS, and so. So again, a lot of insights that you can uh, you can then uh, analyze. And here you can see, even in the name, the name for, uh, column in a, in a Nessus report uh, gives you like the missing for Microsoft stuff. It can give you the missing Microsoft patches, uh, so you directly see uh, which one is uh, really missing the most frequent values. Then, uh, as I told you, let's have a, a, a better a better approach, like doing like an SQL queries on the CSV file. That's what I'll be doing. Sorry. Um, here, I'm just, the first option is just saying which kind of uh, format do I have with semicolon and co everything coded. And then I perform the query so you can recognize select host uh, command name. Name is the field that you can see uh, the Microsoft missing patches from my Nessus file where name uh, contains like this good old, <laughs> good old vulnerability that you, you may know of. You might be aware. So I just directly want to filter and I want to uh, pipe it in a CSV look stuff. Uh, it can look really good in your terminal. So here, uh, you can see that um, this is anonymized data, but with this kind of request, you can directly see in a large report which uh, host is vulnerable to this kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. I hope you're convinced, but that's really cool to perform some SQL queries in a, in a dumb flat file. It's pretty new to me. And I think to you also. Then, uh, let's move on. So that's, that was the first demo of CSV kit, which I really encourage you to use. The second one is a, a better, not a better, but a different tool, um, mostly uh, related to data science. It's not a security tool at all. It is called DataIQ. It's a, it's a, a really cool tool. It's a user friendly with a graphical. I will show you just uh, after some, 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 some uh, demos, but it's a very intuitive and user friendly stuff. And it allowed me to, to do some stuff I could not do without it. That's the definition of big data. So to give you a, a, an example, I could easily filter and join some, some file. On one hand, I, I had um, a, a 30 gigs uncompressed file with a hash and a login. And on the second file, I, a 4 gigs file, I had a hash and clear text file. I wanted to join, join this to provide a cool, uh, a cool view, uh, like you can imagine, like in um, a DB, a DB a database leak uh, on the internet, when you want to go th from uh, login hash to, to go th from this to login hash and crack password, which is really easier to see and really practical. So um, with this kind of machine, which is pretty, pretty lame, four cores and uh, 16 gigs, it takes only four hours. This is pretty awesome to to perform the join, a, a real SQL join between 30, a 30 gigs file and a 4 gigs file. Um, so that's pretty amazing, and that's the power of data science today and this kind of tool such as uh, Dataiku. There are some cool tutorials on their, on their website. I just encourage you to, to see them. So it looks like this, uh, really, Dataiku. You, you, uh, you write some, some recipe here. I can write some data preparation recipe, join, and so. Um, already 10 minutes? Wow. Okay, <laughs> I will move really forward. That here you can see that you can easily uh, uh, look some stuff, look at some stuff, easily filter, easily draw some charts, even like click and go. Uh, so that's it. Then let's move to the second trick: parallel execution. So in our work, we every time uh, extract some result, launch some different tasks. We want to multitask. We want to multi-thread everything. And uh, when you cannot do it uh, easily because your tool is not made uh, with a multi-thread inside, you need an external tool such as GNU Parallel. I don't know if you know it, but GNU Parallel is a Perl script to parallelize any command on a Linux system, Unix system. It's a replacement of Xargs, and it has a lot of more options than Xargs. 
progress bar, uh, uh, job resume, and even ECSH login to distribute the task uh, among a different um, different server. So at the end, my work uh, when I work, it, it looks more my HTOP looks more like this than this. So I'm really happy that my machine is really computing some stuff. Um, an example, uh, an application example of parallel. Here I have uh, a target list. I'm using WFOST to enumerate. Um, it's not 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> thank you. Um, here I'm using WFOST to, to, to perform a URL discovery um, task on every, uh, every target that you can see here simultaneously. Uh, instead of going from like one, two, three, and starting over uh, to the three uh, next one. I'm doing for every 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 target simultaneously, just to speed up the process. That's really uh, that's really cool. And here you can see the power of parallel. Uh, you can input in your command in your process some direct Perl slash set expression to remove bad chars in file name in the outputs because here that you can see my my entry my input file contains some bad characters for Unix. You can write some some file with this kind of character here. Uh, colon and slash slash. So here I'm just replacing them in line uh, through the process, and I can even automate like when I do have the WFuzz result, just to 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 type to to pipe them to another tool called Web Screenshot. Uh, if I want to, uh, after discovering which URL are really accessible, just try to perform some screenshots. So Web Screenshot is a tool I did also, just to it's a simple tool to take some screenshots about a URL. So you pipe your discovery and your screenshotting with two commands, two crafted commands that you can replay every time. You can adapt. And here you, you have, um, your first uh, step of work of penetration testing done. And you can, you can concentrate and focus on more interesting stuff than just typing some two commands and following them, starting over, um, resuming some jobs and so on. So you just give it to parallel and you just focus on other stuff. Another example um, is another uh, common common step is DNS enumeration. When you want not only to perform URL enumeration but DNS enumeration, um, you can pipe parallel, for example, which has subdomains as the input uh, input file and dig, which is the DNS resolver. Don't use NS lookup, use dig. Um, and with parallel. It looks like really cheap to, to perform this kind of stuff. Just look at the blog post from Mubix uh, in 2014. He, 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 he was saying that it was a cheap method, but it is really cheap compared to a proper optimized tool. Let's, let's do the computation. So I, I, I tried. So I used GoBuster, which is a, a Go utility to perform a lot of enumeration, not only in DNS, but you can do DNS enumeration with it. It's Go language, so it's natively multi-thread, multi-processed. Uh, it's a compiled by a native binary, um, and I will compare it to parallel plus dig. So by enumerating some domains, for instance Google, that was the test, it, take, it, it took me 22 seconds uh, to perform that enumeration, while with parallel and dig, it took me only 27 seconds. So it's like 30% overhead. I don't consider it as cheap as possible because um, from a proper optimized tool, you only have a 30% overhead with some really native tool. You don't need the Golang environment and so on. You just need parallel and dig, which uh, uh, dig is pretty present on every uh, every distribution. For parallel, you can easily install it with apt yum and so apt install parallel, and that's okay. Um, and you maybe most you you will mostly find parallel than go on a on a, on a standard and common uh, server. So. I don't think it's pretty cheap, and it really works. It really you combine some parallel stuff with some native tool. You combine them, and you have like a, an almost optimized tool. That's pretty awesome to me. So um, yeah, let's let's move forward for more interesting demo. I had a demo just to to show you what dig dig plus parallel looks like, but uh, I will kind of focus on more interesting uh, demos. So third advice. Use a high level scripting language for easier static and dynamic analysis of binary. So, because pen testing sometimes involves some custom slash what the fuck obfuscation or encryption. Why? Just because people do not understand crypto. That's a fact. Uh, and then they reinvent the wheel every time. Sometimes you don't want to go down the rabbit hole to figure out what's that fucking uh, custom, what the fuck crypto is doing, and why it, it has been invented by some creepy people. 
sometimes you, you cannot just replicate and rip the code into your favorite language. And for example, I was looking at how Oracle WebLogic Server encrypts its local password. So it's using PBKDF, PKCS12, SHA1 plus, plus RC2. And at that time, uh, if you know the crypto system, you want to replicate it in uh, another language, you need uh, your, your favorite language module to, to perform it. But at the time, no Python module was exi uh, existing to support that crypto system. Uh, it was uh, Oracle WebLogic Server was using Bonsi Castle from the Java world. And if you want to do it in Python, it, does, it wouldn't exist at the time. I don't know if it's still uh, the case or not. But the, the answer to this is to use a high-level scripty language in your favorite language, but instrumenting some different language. You will see what, what that means just after. So let's start with Jiton. So Jiton is, uh, is a tool, is, is a framework or a suite of language that allows you to write Java code in Python. So with the Python syntax, calling Java code. You can use in the same line, I would, I would even mean, you can use either Java classes and Python libraries in the same line with Python syntax, which is pretty convenient, I guess, for you and for me, because I don't like Java, I don't, as I don't like to compile some stuff, I don't like semicolon, uh, brackets, and so on, so um, I, I really like to perform some stuff in Python. Then, you also have the same for .NET application, like Iron Python, which again, can allow you to write .NET code in Python syntax, mixing um, .NET classes and Python libraries in the same script. This is really awesome. Uh, who, who in this room ever heard about Jiton or Iron Python? Oh, some, some hands, that's cool. And finally, um, for everything else, when you want to instrument everything else, just use Frida because Frida allows you to write some Python or JavaScript or QML or Swift or .NET to inject some C++ scripted in JavaScript through, <laughs> through the um, uh, Google engine to instrument assembly, Objective-C or Dalvik <laughs> on Windows platform, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. That's awesome. So use Frida as much as you can, and I wrote Panther also, and Jiton. But Frida, you can do everything with Frida. So just to have like a, 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 an example, on the left, you will see like a, a classical Java code doing encryption, cryptography. You recognize the Java bullshit with a secret key spec, cipher, par IV parameter spec, and all the classes. Uh, the do final stuff also, which is I never <laughs> understood why, but uh, and on the right you have the Jiton version of it, calling the same classes but in, in a different syntax, in the Python syntax. So you recognize I named the variable the same, but you recognize that you can call the same classes. I'm doing the same Java crypto f with the Python language, Python, Python syntax, and uh, it has some uh, real world uh, application. Uh, I did my script. Uh, my script to, to decrypt WebLogic password, I could not do, do it in Python, so I did it in Jiton. So you just need Jiton, again, apt install, yum install Jiton, and that's it. Um, let's have a demo for this. Just to show you that I'm, it's pretty, I want to convince you that it's pretty easy, easy to use. Um, so here, I will just show you, uh, okay, this example, a, a, a simple Jiton script. So it's pretty, pretty simple. You recognize the classes, you recognize the stuff. Um, I'm just encrypting your swag with the Java classes, with the Python syntax. And how to execute it? It's as easy as this. You will see the result here. So I'm just printing uh, the X version and the plain text. Plain text doesn't mean anything, but um, here, uh, uh, do you see how easy it is to, to use and to, to instrument Java in different languages? Uh, now you have the same, uh, I can show you the same for um, .NET. So, um, mm, mm, mm. here, uh, I have a script that I can show you. Let me check. Here I'm playing with DP API. Who knows DP API in the Windows world? D so, DP API is the common way to encrypt and a secret way to encrypt data on your Windows platform because it's it's using not um, hard-coded keys or, or so on. It has only two methods, protect and unprotect, and it, and it can encrypt with the user context, so the user hash, password, account, or the, the machine accounts. 
so it can give you, it can protect you on a, on a, a shared machine. If you encrypt some, encrypt some stuff with the user context, like a service account or, or human account, it can protect this data from decryption from other users. So you need to be the, the good users to be able to decrypt the correct data. So here, um, you can, you can play with .NET and C Sharp code and so on, but with Iron Python, you can also do it and uh, again instrument the data, instrument the classes. Uh, I'm calling the, the real, the, the real version of, um, of .NET classes. So just to show you, I'm calling the Iron, Iron Python, um, uh, interpreter, giving in, giving it my, my proper script. And here I'm just, uh, showing you that I, again, I encrypted the swag. And here you can see the raw uh, user uh, DP API encryption. This, this is bullshit. This doesn't mean anything, but uh, it can show you that it works. And with some simple script, you can instrument different languages and different core, uh, classes. So that's, again, that's pretty convenient. And, um, so I was just, again, the, the script looks like this. So you can, rec you recognize, uh, different classes. And it has a, a first, I guess, real world application. So a few days ago, a few weeks ago, the guy behind CrackMap Exec by Bleeder released at DerbyCon, I think, uh, a cool post exploitation uh, tool, which is called Silent Trinity. So Silent Trinity is a native binary, um, uh, embedding the Iron Python interpreter and as a C2, uh, for, for C2 communication and, and further code exploitation and code execution. You send not, you, you don't send C sharp or .NET stuff. You send some Iron Python script and the native binary embedding the Iron Python, um, um, interpreter will interpret them. So you have the power to escape from PowerShell logging, uh, P logging, uh, P, uh, um, malware analysis, PowerShell malware analysis. So you, you, you move everything to .NET and C sharp. But here you have the, uh, the practical stuff that you can perform some operation with a Python language, which is pretty easy and convenient. So again, our first real life example. And finally, um, the, maybe the, the latest, but not the least, uh, um, trick is to compile Python scripts on the fly because in many cases you need to have a compiled version of tools, uh, in, independently of your language, independently of your targets and so on. Sometimes you're on the target, but you, you don't have the proper tool execution environment. Let's say, I, I think you ever messed with PowerShell versions, like PowerView or, or Kerberos thing scripts and so on, not having the good, the, the proper uh, PowerShell version installed on your target. And you cannot install some stuff because you are not root, you are, you don't have any outgoing connection to the internet also. You are lazy. That's a good, a good excuse. Uh, you cannot have a proper reverse shell of metapreter because metapreter, <laughs> metasploit meta fails again. I don't know. And maybe because you just want to evade some antivirus. So one advice is to compile everything, compile your, your favorite Python, Python tools with PyInstaller. What is PyInstaller? So PyInstaller bundles a Python script, your, your script with a Python interpreter in a native binary. So how to do it is again pretty easy. Just install one, one compiler for your target, for your, on your, on your, not on your target, but on your host ma hosting machine. Just install pinstaller with pip, uh, and then, um, just pinstall your script. So pinstaller option and your script and that's it. And you can even, you, you can even cross compile binaries for Windows from Linux with Wine. Um, just Google translate this, uh, I know this guy, Tanatos, I, I haven't met him, but I know he's here. So thank you, guy. Thank you. you, you I showed that trick and I will show you just after, then it works. It works for really, that trick. So PyInstaller is really awesome. The, the option, the options you will love are first one file. You package everything in one standalone file. Or if the file is too big, which happens, I will uh, just show you, give you an example just after, but if you don't want one file, you can have at least one directory. That's pretty, again, convenient to zip and to, to move and to port to everything else. But one day I create a single directory with everything because, uh, in one of my cases, I compiled a, a, a cool tool named Patator with every dependencies. You will see just after again. I'm not disclosing anything, but, uh, the, exec the final executable was really too big, like 20 megs. And when you click it, when you want to execute it, the first step is to dezip, unzip everything. And it takes a really a lot of time. Um, and maybe one directory is better to have everything and uh, to have a, a quicker execution time. 
You have also, when you want to evade antivirus, that works really. Uh, you can provide a, a custom key, encryption key. Of course, the key is, is included in the zip payload of the, in the native binary, because the binary should be able to decrypt uh, and to decrypt itself to execute it. But still, with, just with the key, you can evade some antivirus. And then you have the icon file, the icon option, sorry, to provide an icon file just for visual fanciness. So, again, real, real life example of, um, of script of, um, compiled with this. The first is a, um, is a suite of tool coming from Impacket. Who in this room ever use Impacket? Who knows about Impacket? So few hands. Impacket is the framework, the most used framework to interact with Windows stuff from files, network, domains. Um, it's a, it's a core cool framework that's really awesome. It has several examples doing some tiny tasks again, like in the Unix philosophy. And I just compiled, I, I managed to compile every example to a standalone binary that you can drop where you want. And trust me, it is used mostly, mostly by, by guy. I, uh, in many, many reports I found that uh, some black hat people are really using them to attack some real life infrastructure. So it works. What are the examples coming from Impacket? I don't know if you ever, do you rec recognize some, some tools? Like PSExec, not the sys internal PSExec, the Impacket PSExec supporting ashes and so. You have a Mimikatz one, you have NetViews, you have everything else. The golden stuff are Mimikatz again, NTLM relay. I, I'm sure you know uh, what is the NTLM relay and what's the use, what's the use for. PSExec supporting ashes again. Sa summer dump to dump from a remote, a remote location, the local SAM database for, or, or on your target. Secrets dump, which is used to, pro, to parse ntds.dit file, the database file from Windows domain. Uh, SMB exec, SMB relay, again. Ticketer, just to create easily uh, golden silver tickets, playing with Kerberos, that's pretty useful. It's really easier than using Mimikatz, really, to use Ticketer. Uh, oh, two times here. Um, WMI exec, when you want to be still sure, not using the SMB protocol, not using the PS exec version. WMI persis, WMI query, just to perform some raw query on the target. Um, that's pretty cool to have everything, everything packed in a single executable. The, the best use case I found is really related to secrets dump because again, in large engagements, I had a lot of domains I managed to pound all of domains. I wanted to extract the database. I had like 10 domains. Every domain I had like 10, 10 gigs at least, 10 gigs or 20 gigs of database. And if you want to collect 10 times 20, uh, the, the raw database to your, okay, thanks, to your, to your, um, um, to your laptop, you need some spaces that I didn't have. You need a good network connectivity, which I, Maybe a uh, hide, I don't know, but it was really uh, heavy. So I just dropped secret dump to the local target, and I processed and I passed the data locally, and I just extracted the result from uh, secret dump, giving me the ashes and the user database. You go from 10, 12, 20 gigs to a few megs. That's pretty convenient to, to gather them instead of um, gathering few gigs. Again, Patator, that was the tool I was mentioning. So Patator is a multi-purpose brute force tool. You can, pro you can brute force everything. That's a, a legacy and old school stuff, but really good. So you can see all the protocol it can brute force. So I managed to compile everything in one binary. And that was a challenge because as you can see, uh, it supports multi uh, different protocols. Is, protocols sorry. Each protocol has his Python library, Python module. Each Python module has his dependencies and you have to pray that every dependencies will fit in one binary. And at the end, it works. Uh, but the, the binary is just 18 megs. And that's a bit long when you want to execute it, but it works. And even inside, so in one, one, uh, one tool, one standalone executable, you have everything you're able to brute force, all of these processes and all of these protocols. That's awesome. Then, crack map exec. I, again, uh, 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 <laughs> my version is really used mostly by black hats. In, in federal reports, I can often read that they, they use this. And then, so let's finish with a demo. Um, it happens a lot. It, it happened a lot to me. You are doing your penetration test. You need a cool Python tool, and you 
there's a, it is a mess to install it and to, you, you cannot install it again on the target. And so, so Hyperbot, what, what was the purpose? It's a cool tool to, to channel traffic, uh, via uh, SOX4 or SOX5 uh, pr um, protocol. It works just like SSH dynamic port forwarding, but without SSH and you can do in opposite direction. So you don't need even, you don't need SSH at the client, the server. You don't need this. And mostly you can do reverse, reverse port forwarding. That's pretty cool. And that's native Python, no external module. This is really cool. So it happened to me like I wanted to compile it just to drop the client on the target side. So you need, uh, you need to drop the client on the target. You need, um, and you need the server to be waiting and listening on your, on your attacking machine. Uh, so, in the follow, in the, in the next demo, I will be compiling from Windows a cli the client, just Windows for Windows. From a Linux box, I will be compiling the server for Linux, because Linux is my attacking machine in that case. And I will cross compile, thanks to Thanatos tricks, uh, cross compile the clients for Windows from Linux with Wine, uh, NPI installer, and it works. And at the end, both clients should be the same almost, and should be able to connect back to the server. So that's what we will see. So uh, what was the procedure? So in, on the Linux, I will just compile and show you how to compile a, a simple binary, no, no cross-compilation, Linux to Linux. It's the same for Windows to Windows. Uh, okay. So here, the command is pyinstaller clean, just to clean some of previous caches, cache, uh, one file, because I want everything in one single executable. And I will just name it server, which is, uh, that's the dash n uh, option. So I'm launching the compilation. Um, and it will build a native binary. So it, it did it successfully. I'm going to the dist folder. And I will just show you that you, you can, oh, sorry. You can see, uh, the server binary. I'm just, I'm not fooling you. Uh, this is a real, real executable. So that was a Python 3 before. Now it is a binary. Uh, and it works just the same, such as the Python script, so you recognize the different option here. So that's okay, I compile the server. Now I will just compile, and it's not really useful, but uh, Windows to Windows stuff. Um, so again, I will compile the client on Lin uh, Windows, for, win for Windows, just so I want a PE file. Again, it's compiling. Again, I'm going to the dist folder. And here you can see that uh, I compiled, uh, it, sorry, client compiled from Windows. And again, uh, from Windows. Oh, shit. I'm on Windows, sorry. <laughs> and it works the same. I, I, I went from a, a, a Python script to a binary. And right now, here's the magic. I will cross compile a Python script from Linux for Windows with Wine. It should work. So the syntax is pretty simple. So you call Wine, use, you um, tell him to use pyinstaller.exe that I install in my local, local Wine repository to provide a standard binary, so one file, the clients, that will name just client compile from Linux just to, to see the difference between the compilation. Uh, sorry, I missed. I need clean. So, it should work, let's hope. And in the end, I will try to connect the cross-compiled stuff to the Linux standard module, and it should work. So, apparently it worked. Uh, again, so I can see here the client compiled from Linux, that's the new version. I had one because I, I tried, but here's the good one. You can, again, see that uh, it is a true binary. Here I'm see, it's saying that it is a it's a P file. Um, here I should see you should see that it works. Okay, right now so program should work. I will just try to connect them. So I will just break down the, the syntax. So first I will be launching the server on Linux. So I'm launch, launching the real binary and the real Airpavit script. Verbose, server port here, server IP listen on every interface, proxy IP and proxy port. So I want on my attacking machine, just like proxy, sh that you can proxy chain after, 
it should uh, set up a, a, a socket w uh, listening on the on that port and tunneling the stuff to the client so, so to the target so first i'm launching i'm launching it on the server side and the second step is to to compile uh, not to compile to to execute the client compiled uh, from linux to connect back uh, to the to the server waiting on my linux box so i think the ip of my linux box is one yeah okay So let's see, and it works. So here, here's the tunnel. I received the communication from client to a server, and here you can see that with netstat that I'm, I do have my tunnel, my local tunnel, and my attacking machine. And every traffic I will send to this socket will go through the tunnel and go back and and go out from the client that I just attacked. So that works. Thanatos, thanks for the tricks. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally, um, oh, maybe I, how, how time? One minute? Okay. As a quick conclusion, it's pretty uh, easy. So, CSV kit everything, that IQ everything, GNU parallel everything, Jiton everything, Iron Python everything, Freda everything, and P install everything. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> All right, if not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>